The Treasury puts out a report every single year and they labeled the report last year an, an unsustainable fiscal path. They literally labeled it for the whole world That's to right. see. It's a red flag to, not to the world, they're trying to warn Congress. They're like, you guys got to stop spending. We can't keep pumping debt like this. And that's the path we're on. And we're just going to continue doing it until it just spirals out of control. It'd be like, a, you know, whoops, helicopter blade came off and that's it. <laughs> Suddenly we have these ETFs that have splashed onto the stage and you've got this super highway that's built. And they're not sitting there saying, oh, well, we're going to wait until it comes back to 63,000. They're just like, well, we need to buy it buy it and then when you're done we're gonna have a hundred hundred million more and when you're done with that we're gonna have a hundred million dollars more mr james lavish thank you so much for coming on to the show today i'm a playable character show i, I joke with everybody that you know we're in a sea of non-playable characters so we're always trying to find the ones who can critically think and and actually, you know, put forth an effort, I guess, when it comes to thinking. Uh, so thank you for coming on the show today, brother. Yeah, of course. Great to be here, Brandon. Happy to uh, talk to you. So for those who don't know James, just a little bit, uh, he's a I'm reading from his Twitter bio, which actually I'll share here, formed hedge fund manager, played at Yale played hockey at Yale. Uh, so uh, we're kindred spirits in that regard, uh, playing college hockey, uh, drafted by the Bruins, landed on Wall Street. So very, very interesting background and the author of the Informationist newsletter, which is a phenomenal letter. And I have talked to many Bitcoiners uh, just that read your letter and uh, really, truly simplifying things for all. And also you are, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're a GP, a general partner with the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund as well, which we'll touch right. on here as well. So just a little background yeah. on that. That's right. Uh, yeah, so I'm the, I'm one of the, I'm a co-managing partner uh, with David Foley uh, on the on the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, and we are we are actively investing, and we just closed our um, our capital raise. So we're we're pretty excited. It's been a, it's been a fun ride for the last year and a <laughs> half. So, uh, but this is a yeah, we're in, we're in a tremendous opportunity in, in my opinion. Oh. So it's good. Incredible. Well, we can touch on that a little bit. I was telling you off stage, I want to kind of just get your the lay of the land from you. You know, like I, I was telling you, I was talking to some of the other fellas earlier this week and asking, you know, some pointed questions, but I wanted to kind of just maybe let you riff for a few minutes and just kind of like, what are you, what's keeping you up at night? What are you thinking about? Could be Bitcoin, could be macro, could be the United States government, could be you know economic malaise, the, the crazy things you see on social media and rioting, protesting, people beat each other up, <laughs> not on the hockey rink. Um, so what's <laughs> <laughs> people just in the streets, kids, just craziness, kind of social decay everywhere. I mean, what what's keeping James Lavish up at night right now? Well, uh, okay, those are that's a lot of vectors to to touch on, <laughs> but um, yeah, I I try to avoid the the noise as much as I can. It's not easy, uh, I will admit, especially on on Twitter X. You know, you have this constant stream of uh, social consciousness, and so. I do try to avoid that when I see some stuff that's super disturbing. I just, you know, say not interested and hopefully the algorithm picks up on that sooner or later. But uh, what is keeping me up at night, truly, honestly, is my excitement about Bitcoin right now. And mm. that's truthful. Uh, I am not, you know, my portfolios, personal portfolios, the ones that I share on, uh, on in my uh, paid group for the informationist that I, I feel super well positioned for anything that happens here, whether we have a melt up or we have a meltdown. I feel like we're, I'm protected. I'm, I'm not, I'm not worried about uh, my personal portfolios. I'm excited, super excited about uh, Bitcoin and the opportunities here. And, and I mean, these ETFs have unlocked a tremendous amount of capital. So when, you know, if, if what, what has been on my mind, that's not keeping me up, that's keeping me stimulated and I'm really been focused on is just the sheer wall of capital that is uh, starting to trickle in. It's not even like it's, we have not been hit with the tsunami yet. I even posted about it last night and that wasn't tongue in cheek. I, I mean, I'm being dead serious that this is going to take a while. It's going to, it's going to, um, it's, it's going to continue to grow and gain momentum. And that doesn't mean that we won't have volatility. I want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. trying to make sure that people understand and are tempered in their enthusiasm. As enthusiastic as I am, I still expect Bitcoin to be volatile. 
It's normal for this asset. It's a growing asset. It's still nascent. You know, I mean, it's we're only, we're not even 15 years in here. And so, um, you know, it's, it's starting to gain that mass. Uh, it's not even momentum. It's just this, it, the, the, the understanding, the, the, uh, the desire to understand it is growing. So let's put it that way. Um, so, but with the ETFs, what's been, what's been so important about that is, and I've talked about this so many times, but just in a re really quick recap is, and I get this so often, like why would people buy ETFs rather than just Bitcoin itself? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, number one being the institutions just can't buy that. They, they just can't buy Bitcoin in a way that would uh, suffice their their compliance and uh, you know their fiduciary duties. You know, no no portfolio manager from a big pension fund wants to be holding keys to Bitcoin, particularly not if you're if you're managing hundreds of billions of dollars. You don't want to you don't want to be holding keys to billion dollars of Bitcoin. Nobody wants to do that. So, uh, and even if you did, you're not going to get compliance to agree to that. You're going to have to go through hoops and, uh, you know, you have to walk on coals. And so, and the fiduciary and personal uh, risk is just too high. So they're not doing it. And then registered investment advisors who advise, they advise clients, they actually invest money for their clients. They, they have not had the incentive or the ability to do so either because of the same problems. You know, it, it, it's not like you can just buy this and put it in, in a wallet for your customers. You, these, uh, these banks the, and the investment funds, uh, you know, they use what's called a prime broker. And, you know, you know this, Brandon, but uh, for your listeners, they use a prime broker that actually custodies you know, their, their assets for them. And so you would have to have a qualified custodian and you'd have to have, to have special agreements. Where is it going to trade? Is that an exchange that that's, uh, has oversight from the SEC? How is it going to settle? Who's going to settle? You know, it, it, there's, there's just a litany of, of answers, of questions that have to be answered and uh, problems have to be solved. Now, enter, and, and as for the other people, why would an individual buy the ETF? Well, because they don't feel comfortable buying a signing device, what we call wallets. You know, they're actually signing devices and and having that risk. I mean, I'm going to admit just a few years ago, I did it for the first time. It was nervy for me. I mean, I was like, where is this? How, how do I know it's settled? You know, and so and I'm not. At my age, I, I wouldn't call myself a, uh, a tech savant, but I'm tech savvy enough. You know, I'm, I come from the BlackBerry world, so I'm used to tech. And so, um, but even for me, it was it was uncomfortable. A little bit got get me out outside my comfort zone. Can you imagine someone who's in their in their you know 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s who are are using a signing device like that? Just doesn't sound like it's it's something they want to do. Now, flash forward, suddenly we have these ETFs that have splashed onto the stage and, uh, and you've got this super highway that's built. So it's, uh, they're, they're not stocks. They're, they're, they're basically trust, they're funds, but they own underlying Bitcoin in them. And that's supposed to match the amount of money that, that people have, have bought those shares for on these exchanges. So, and it's pretty simple though, though those ETFs, own the underlying Bitcoin and the individuals who are buying that can buy it through their broker, their trading exchange. You can set, settle it with your, your prime broker. If you're an institution, they can custody it. You know, it's a, it's a same uh, settlement process and DTC process for you uh, putting margin on it or whatever you're, you're doing with your, you know, regular trade. It probably requires, it certainly requires more margin than, you know, something uh, that's a, a mainstay stock um, like an Apple or something. But, mm -hmm. you know, it you, you don't have any of the those settlement issues. You don't have any of those custody issues. You know exactly where it's going to be marked. You know how it's going to be uh, custodied and, and you don't have to have an, a, a, you know, a special process that's designed by your chief compliance officer, by your general counsel. You just buy it and settle it just like a regular stock. It's super easy. Now, all that said, 
why have we not seen just a wall of capital, right? We're seeing this, not a trickle, but a solid stream of capital coming in every single day. Uh, you know, Larry Lepard had uh, retweeted something this morning that should just, just the sheer, I think it was uh, from Bitcoin Archive from Archie, you know, uh, where it's just a, this steady stream of capital comes in every single day, somewhere between a half a half a, a billion and a billion dollars that are coming into these ETFs. That's new money coming into the space every single day. It's not a wall of capital, but what you're seeing is these on-ramp, on-ramps are being built where you've got these registered investment advisors, the brokers, the institutions, the family offices, they've gotten their, their compliance in place. They've gotten their pamphlet in place. They can you know, make their investors aware of the risks and they can have the check the box and go ahead and buy it and settle it just like a regular stock now. And it's starting to happen across the board, but it's, it's happening steadily, but slowly. And that's why I said last night that it's still not priced in. You know, the amount of capital that's going to come into this space is a, a magnitudes of, of, of multiples of what we've seen so far. And it's going to be over the course of, of months and, you know, and uh, perhaps even longer. So that is a long answer to what has been on my mind. But truly, that is that's been my focus recently. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm glad that I started with that because, yes, there's a lot on your mind, as with many Bitcoiners. And that's probably how a lot of the, the shows, in a way, should start, I guess, is, you know, what what is on your mind? What's going is, you know, as you know, Bitcoiners, there's always a lot on a Bitcoiner's mind. So I appreciate you sharing that. How do you, you know, it makes me think of a few things like, like you said, the wall of cash. You know, it's it's inconceivable, the wall of cash, the amount of cash. It's not in Bitcoin, obviously. It's all out into other assets, it's around emerging markets, you name it, real estate, bond market. It, it's really, you can't even fathom. It's it, You can't wrap your head around it. And then you have Larry, like I was saying earlier, Larry, I was talking to Larry the other day too, and he was talking about the ETF multiplier, right? Where you have these effects of just this, like you said, the amount that you laid out coming in, but the multiples of the increase of the price, the fiat price for a Bitcoin have just been exploding or, you know, in the market cap growing, I guess is probably the better way to look at it. That's, it's mind blowing. And then that's a, a small move, really. It's right. There's a small amount that's come in so far of the world you know, liquidity. It's yeah. wild. So let's, so let's unpack that. So um, first of all, the multiplier. Right. So if 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 you set if you step into the marketplace and there are no offers for Bitcoin between here and and 100,000, say there's just no offers there. You look at the book and there's nothing offered there. You yeah. could buy one dollar of Bitcoin at one hundred thousand dollars price. And that takes that market cap all the way up to that. Now, everybody's made made that, you know, paper gain because there was just no liquidity. And that's yeah. what you're seeing here. You're seeing more. You're seeing more buying demand than selling demand. It's it, it sounds mm -hmm. super simple and stupid, but and you know, but that's exactly what it is. It's just that there there is there's been pockets of illiquidity, and so and those pockets are closing on the way up. So even though we've had call it ten billion dollars net 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 come in. The GBTC selling has been uh, absorbed by the mo mostly by the other ETFs, and then uh, the additional capital has come in is about ten trillion dollars ish. You know, um, it's probably it's closer probably to twelve now, but uh, let's call it that. And but the the point is that Bitcoin has risen by hundreds of billions of dollars in market value since the launch of these ETFs. So the multiplier is somewhere north of, it, I did it a few days ago, it was north of 40, 45, I think it was. So, Jeez. but, you know, 37 now, on Monday. So <laughs> now it's, yeah. So, and now here we are three days, two days later. It's wild. So if, if you, so, and it'll settle down, you know, as we get more, as we get higher in price, we get more, it, it will settle down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and remember, that's just, you're just looking at the ETFs there. So the multiplier is probably lower True. than that, you know, so, but uh, net, 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 that's, that's what's happening on the multiplier side. Now, the amount of capital that's out there. So if you step back, Brandon, and you look at the investable assets in the world, right? The biggest thing in the world is, is real estate, right? So you've got your residential real estate is at $500 trillion. 
You've got commercial real estate, which is about 115 or 120. You've got bonds, which are about 130 trillion. You've got stocks around the world, which are 110, 115, it's fluctuating. You've got about $90 trillion of, of just cash and equivalents out there. Um, and then you've got gold, which is about 10 trillion. And then all the way at the bottom there, you've got Bitcoin, which is about 1 trillion. And you could add in things like uh, art and collectibles for another 20 or 30 trillion. But that you're talking about somewhere about 950 trillion to one quadrillion dollars of assets out there, investable assets. And Bitcoin is making up just it, it, it's it's tiny. It's 0.1 percent of the total, you know. <laughs> um, so now when you let's let's dig in, let's just drill in a little bit deeper. Right. So um, I posted something earlier this week again about uh, Bitcoin had climbed up to the eighth largest asset in the world. It just toppled silver. Oh, um, and you've got things up there like Saudi Aramco. You know, you've got Apple and Microsoft and Google and so uh, and NVIDIA like these. These are massive assets, but those are in that stock. Those that that's one hundred and ten trillion dollars of stock bucket. Yeah. So um, so. But the, the point is that we'll start to see reallocation out of things like stocks and gold. We've seen that ETFs have been bleeding in gold. Uh, and so that's been interesting. Um, but then also uh, you've got people who buy real estate just for long term investments. And so that that might be a bucket that starts to bleed into here. But the first bucket that's going to bleed in there is from these pension funds, from the institutions, the endowments that are saying, OK, uh, I need to have a half a percent or one percent allocation to Bitcoin. And now we're seeing. BlackRock putting it into their funds. So it's an ETF that's being put into their big ETF fund that has a, a number of different assets, but they're going to allocate it in there. So now you're going to have people who own the BlackRock asset. That's a that's a, a BlackRock equity bond fund or whatever. And then that's going to be an allocation in there. So you'll have people don't even realize that they own Bitcoin, but it's part of the allocation of this bigger fund. So when we when you look at BlackRock with somewhere around ten trillion dollars of assets, you know, so if they make just one percent, I mean, one percent uh, position allocation across the board, that's a that's a massive amount for for that uh, for that one institution. So and they're just one institution; they're they're one of, if not the largest, but they're right up there in the top two or three. But you know. This is this is what you're going to start to see now. Lastly, so unpacking this further, which will tie us back to that uh, that multiplier effect. When you're an institution and I've sat in this seat for many years and you need an allocation of something, you're you're not really price sensitive. You know, you're not looking and going, oh, well, it's up three percent today. You're not doing that. You're saying, well, I need one percent in my portfolio. So you get you get the amount you need, the hundred million dollars, and you call up your broker or you talk to your 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 uh, sales trader on the other side, Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. You say, I need to buy a hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin today. So go in there and buy, you know, FBTC or IBIT. Just participate, and so mm -hmm. they just participate along with the rest of the volume. They may end up driving volume, but it's called volume weighted average price, the VWAP. They just want to participate and they're not sitting there saying, oh, well, we're going to wait until it comes back to 63,000. They're just like, well, we need to buy it, buy it. And then when you're done, we're going to have a hundred, a hundred million more. And when you're done with that, we're going to have a hundred million dollars more. And then when you're done with that, we're going to have a hundred million dollars more. And it's literally, this is just what's happening. And this is going to happen in perpetuity, not in perpetuity, but for, I can see a, a foreseeable future, whether it's the next number of weeks, the next number of months. But uh, that's just the function and the way that Wall Street works, the way that institutional investing works. Now, <laughs> lastly, this is all holding all else equal. You know, we haven't even talked about interest rates, the Fed, what's going on in yeah. uh, the deficits and with, with them, uh, the overall markets. Those can have an impact, certainly, to 
a an asset like Bitcoin, as we've seen. So holding all everything else equal, we're just in this period of, well, looks like we're going to have this beautiful soft landing. This is what's happening. It's wild. It's absolutely wild. What really quickly on the, so some of the ETF stuff, I know this is a question that will come up, like it comes up in spaces a lot or like, you know, you conferences or people will be thinking or just chatter. How, how does, you know, how, how are the ETF settled? I guess, is it, is it cash settled? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it is cash settled. I, I'm not this positive. Was a big, this is a big thing. Yeah. This is a big thing. I think with the SEC is they didn't want uh, investors to be able to, to redeem so there's two things. They didn't want the investors to be able to redeem their um, FBTC or IBIT or whatever the uh, other, yeah. you know. Um, they didn't want to say, well, I want Bitcoin. So they're going to be cash settled, cash redeemable. That's it. Okay. So that was a big thing. How are they buying Bitcoin throughout the day is probably what your real question is. And that's, this is confusing. Yeah. How do we make sure that they oh. are buying it I, or for the person that, yeah. No, they are. So what, what's happening is uh, you have, you have approved uh, participants and, uh, and they, what they do is they're out there. These are pro professional traders, market makers. They're making the market in, in the different ETFs. Mm -hmm. And as people are buying, well, they're hedging that. They're going out and buying futures or options or whatever they need to do to hedge it while they need. The, so then at the end of the trading day, they settle out, okay, this is how much we need to buy. I'm hedged 100% on that. So you're going to see mm -hmm. the Bitcoin price move throughout the day according to the price of, of the uh, activity in the market. It's not like people are buying in, in the day and then overnight it jumps because they had to buy overnight and then they buy it during the day and then overnight it jumps again. That's not the way it, it, they're settling it and they're and they're uh, they're settling those or they're they're filling those trades throughout the day. They're hedging them throughout the day and then they're going to match up and swap basically they have one one big block trade uh after hours or the next morning where they settle it with the etf and you know the etf is buying and they're selling and then they're all and then you know they're clean and then that's it so but that's what's happening essentially is is the market I guess I don't even know how this is done either. I mean, obviously the back in the day in, I don't know if it was like this when you started in wall street or if you had already missed it, but when, you know, guys are in the pit and, you know, right. You're trading back and forth and things are, you're making deals, you're settling stuff there. How is it algorithmic now? Is it computers that are ones market making and selling? Are there guys doing it? Like, how is this and how is this pertain to the Bitcoin part of this? Where, how are these markets being made? All the and above. This price, you know, all of the above. I mean, they're using every every single tool they have to their at their disposal that they're hedging it. And, and you know, and, you know, fair disclosure, I have not traded in many years. I've been managing portfolios and had other people trading. Um, so these trading tools have gotten highly sophisticated. And they, <laughs> you know, when I say when I say just participate, be on the VWAP, we have got I've got old school traders who can do it, you know, by uh, by instinct. But then wow. you've got other people that just put it in this computer program and it does it automatically. So it, it, it it's all of the above. Wow. That's wild. Is there any way to, to, again, you know, making sure, obviously in the Bitcoin world, it's, you know, not your keys, not your coins, like you said, but there is a huge segment of society where the, the ETFs are that kind of first foray. It makes it easier for people to get into it. How do you make sure you know you're you're we're sending cash to Ukraine and the politicians are like, well, we don't need the amendment to audit the cash. Uh, how do how do we audit the the ETFs? I mean, I know there's you get some like Joe Calasero will say, well, that's the rules. Like the, it's a contract. They they have to audit it. It's there. I tend to disagree. I don't trust the government that much or or entities inside there. How how are you making sure? How are we making sure that those purchases are are happening? Well, some of them are actually posting the uh, the addresses that have the Bitcoin in them. So we know that um, the other ones are using approved auditors. Uh, you've got oversight from the SEC. Uh, you know, it's in BlackRock's interest to own the Bitcoin. They're making fees off this. It's not like this is not going to be the my opinion <laughs> is that this is not going to be the rug. This is not going to be the rug pull of the century. They're in the business of making money. They're not in the business mm -hmm. of, of scamming people. And in order to do that, they need to uphold their agreement. 
I'm with Joe Carlosari on this, that this is, a, you know, this is the way that it's structured and the way it works. It's just like Apple. How do you know that your, your, um, your custodian is actually owning Apple? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. look, there, there are, this is not Bernie Madoff where he just lied about it and told his investors he was doing all these things and the, and the auditors just kind of glanced right past it and just signed off on it and went out to dinner instead, which was just, it's an incredible story. But this is, you know, th this, this involves thousands and thousands of people in these firms that you'll have dozens, if not hundreds of people who will be touching these things daily you know, um, in each firm. So this is, these, these are, this is a big deal. Uh, it, I, I just, I don't see how they would, it would have to be a systematic, uh, you know, collusion from the top down, including the SEC, including BlackRock, including Fidelity, including like it would just, I just don't see how that could, how that could happen. Well, it's good. Hopefully it lends confidence to, you know, people watching or just over time, people seeing that. So that's, that's good, good news. Um, Transitioning a little bit here, what uh, what are your thoughts on you know uh, Groman and, and Preston the other day? We we're talking about uh, you know Warren Buffett's cash position, you know. And again, we get it; he's ninety five years old. That's probably part of what's going on. However, he's still looked at obviously as as the oracle, and he's you know he's a guy. What you know, but he's he signifies a lot of society though, in, in a way, right? So you have these cash positions building and things of that nature, and it's just melting away. I mean, what you know, in your eyes, I mean, what is what did Michael Saylor see uh, that Warren Buffett doesn't see, or, or you know, and people like them, right? Paul Tudor Jones and Druckenmiller versus you know whoever on the Buffett side, right? You can't get any more traditional old school than Warren Buffett, and you know True. I cannot, I I can't criticize Warren Buffett. He's he's made an absolute fortune in the world that he lives in, in the world that we've lived in institutionally, you know, institutional investing. So what is he doing? Well, he's being paid more to sit on cash now than he has in 20 years. So why wouldn't he do that? If he thinks that there's risks to market turmoil, which I believe there are risks, absolutely. Then why wouldn't he sit on that cash? He's, he's sitting on, on you know, he's, he's not just sitting on cash that's not earning anything. He's, he's earning somewhere north of 5%, I would imagine, on, on average on that cash he's sitting on while he waits for opportunities. If we do have market turmoil, he'll step in and take advantage of it. That's his MO. He's a value investor, deep, deep value. And so he wants cash generating businesses that he can value. He can't value Bitcoin. That's the problem. He looks at it and he says, I don't know how to value that. That's not in my purview. It's not in, yeah. it's not on my fairway that I've made all this money all these years on. Now, I do, I, I, I agree, he's completely wrong about Bitcoin. He and Charlie Munger have been wrong all along, but he's been right about other things, you know, yeah. <laughs> to a great degree. So uh, is it disappointing to hear them speak so badly about it? Sure it is, but they're, they're not, you know, Charlie's gone. He, mm -hmm. it, he you could, the timeline for Warren Buffett isn't 40 years. The right. timeline, hopefully for you and me, you longer than me is, is that or longer. You know, we, we don't know, but that's what our hope is. And so we have a long time and this is a long term uh, thesis for us. So why is he doing that? He's getting paid. Now, is it mel melting away? Uh, well, you and I would argue, yes. Why? Because, I believe that the inflation rate is closer to the expansion of the money, fly, money supply rate, which is over 7% since the 1970s. And if you're only getting paid 5%, you're losing money on, on purchasing power. But when you look at the, the real rate versus what the published CPI rate is, you're getting paid. So that's, that's, that's the argument. Does he care about possibly losing 1.5% on purchasing power annually if he's going to be able to turn around and take advantage of a massive downturn or a huge opportunity somewhere? I don't think so. That's what I, th I, I don't, I don't know Warren. I've never met him. Uh, I respect him greatly. Uh, but 
That is my guess of what he's thinking. And, and cash at the end of the day is it's an option premium you're paying, right? For, for being nimble, you know, I guess. And that's how he looks at it, right? Like he, he keeps increasing I, over the last 15 years. That's because he I, sees I payoffs. Have, <laughs> I have cash in my portfolio that's generating interest as well because I do believe that there will be pockets of opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and that's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good ballast in periods of uncertainty. And we were certainly in a, in a period of uncertainty, certainly in a period of uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, well said is, are those generally in, um, for, like Warren's, for example, would he have those, whatever it is, 130 billion or 150, are those in like 12 months, like, like T-bills or like, you know, what is probably he, shorter. what would probably three okay. month T-bills. Three, okay, even shorter duration. Yeah, yeah, probably. just real short. Yeah, probably because, well, I mean, look, if if uh, if the Fed lowers rates, then um, that's good. So maybe he's got to blend because he's expecting the Fed to lower yeah, rates. Maybe true. he's got to blend out too. But I would say the average maturity is probably three months to a year at most. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So transitioning again a little bit here, I get, so one of the emails I get, which is a pretty funny email uh, as well, besides yours um, is uh, the look lit quiddity email, um, which is, you know, from, you know, whatever wall street or whatever, it's a pretty big letter. And they always have, you know, great memes in there and just stuff like that. But, you know, just anecdotally from my perspective, just seeing this email every single day with, you know, just the different metrics and things like that. I have seen, I don't even know millions of jobs. I mean, every day it seems like there's you count, you count up the headlines, it's like ten thousand there, fifty thousand there. I mean, this is like a year and a half jobs just evaporating everywhere, everywhere. And I wish I would have like had a tally, a counter of just from this email of like all the jobs being lost. But then you like go out in the world and it's just like, well, everything's fine. And there's segments of society that like things are fine. And then there's other segments like we were saying earlier is societal societal to decay. We, you know, where. Where is this like, where does a rubber meet the road? Where does reality like actually set in? And I feel like we're just bugs money, like flying off the cliff or the, or the coyote. And just, we haven't looked down yet. I, I just, it boggles my mind that you can have an economy seemingly like, Hey, things are running. There's not total nuclear war going on, but yet just job losses everywhere and for a year and a half. What, what do you make of that? I don't know. Or help me yeah, understand. <laughs> There's a few things here, and Lynn Alden goes into into great detail about this, uh, and I'll, I'll give a, a brief and quick overview for your listeners, and, and I like to keep things simple. But basically what's happening is we've seen the Fed tighten quite a bit over the past, uh, you know, the last year. Uh, they've been paused since uh, for almost six months now. But they, what happened is the Fed, as the Fed has been tightening, that is restrictive. And so you're you're seeing pockets of of the economy that are suffering from high rates. Uh, so if you're a company that is it has to uh, depend on leverage, for instance, then in borrowing, then you're likely seeing your margins being compressed here because the, your margin of, of profitability being compressed because the cost of capital has gone up. Uh, and so those companies are. They've been unwilling to let employees go because it was so difficult to find people who will work mm, when yeah. we were coming out of the pandemic. So part of it is that waited very long. And so now they're just having, you're seeing swaths of people laid off because like, okay, enough's enough. We can't keep up. Okay. So there, so you've got that going on in one, in one area of the economy where in their pockets of, of, of pain and you can see it. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got this tremendous fiscal spending going on. There's just the incredible irresponsibility coming out of Washington. Spend, you, we're running two trillion dollar deficits, uh, which is seven uh, percent of of GDP, which is just uh, it's unbelievable. We we we've never done this in a, in a period where we're not in recession. Uh, you would expect unemployment to be somewhere between five and ten percent uh, for for us to be running deficits like this. Yet we're doing it, and we're, the deficits are growing. And as the interest rates stay here, and we pay more interest on on our debt, and we grow our debt because of this, uh, the continued deficits, the perpetual deficits, which requires more borrowing, which requires more interest on more debt. It's just getting worse, and so, uh, but that is stimulative. 
It's a bunch of money being poured into the economy yeah. in infrastructure. But like the 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 Inflation Reduction Act is literally causing inflation. I mean, that's the whole it, it, it's it's laughable that they and I saw the the Babylon Bee had an article yesterday, which I love the Babylon Bee had an article that the White House just went ahead and replaced the uh, the press secretary with an actual gas lamp light. So, you know, I mean, like, it's it and it's laughable, you know, and it's both parties. Let's be fair. It it's is, not just, it it's not just the Democrats. Oh, it's all man. government. But it's just yeah. it's silly. We're running these deficit deficits and it's stimulating pockets of the economy. And so you can see that. So you've got some people who are doing well. You've got you've certainly got um, bankers who have done well and are doing well. And then you've got pockets of technology. It's not of, of employees that are not doing great. Uh, they're being laid off. And some of that is AI. Uh, I don't think a ton of it yeah. is yet, but some of it. Uh, but some of it is just enough's enough. The, the cost of leverage is too high. We have to start laying off people to retain the margins. So uh, you're seeing that push and pull. And uh, well, it's clear, it's obvious when you look at the screens, you look at my screens and what I'm looking at all day long, well, the fiscal deficits are winning. And uh, I said it on, on uh, Scott Melker's show on Monday morning that it just feels like you've got Godzilla, uh, the the treasury fighting the fed king kong and godzilla's winning and it, it's kind of it's it's kind of amazing that we're we're seeing this play out and it's not really a soft landing as much as just a continued flush of 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 capital and liquidity into the markets uh, or into the economy mm -hmm. um that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are feeling pain of course they are you're seeing defaults on credit cards with younger people rise. You're seeing defaults on, on mortgages, particularly with millennials rise. Uh, there, there are definitely pockets of pain because people can't keep up with the payments. And now you're seeing this surge in buy now, pay later. You're seeing a surge in the amount that, of uh, uh, just the, the amount that people are putting on credit cards, the, the, um, the balances that they're carrying. and so. Uh, there, there will be pockets of pain. It will continue. Uh, it's just a question of is does it break the camel's back at some point where we just we see an onslaught of of unemployment and and job losses from it? It's hard to tell. Wild, uh, yeah. And that's you know the question that you know it's not, I no one knows which is which what's that straw right that's the answer that you know hey if someone knew the answer for what breaks it where in the economy something will break i, mean, I guess you know, and then hey you're nostradamus you you win the prize but that's the question everyone asks right what what do you think the the, the 40 year trend of of rates you know we were talking about this briefly off stage but what are you what is your thought just i guess it could be short term and long term thoughts, but obviously this 40 year trend that we saw from, you know, what was it? The 40s, in essence, World War Two to 1980 and the 1980 to basically now. Are we really, you know, like in this, uh, you know, elongated, you know, rising rate environment going forward? I mean, what are your thoughts? That, they're going to try to suppress now, yield curve control, right? And do what they got to do. But what do we look like long term? I and mean, what is what does the world look like in the coming years and decades here? If you're enjoying this show and you want to get more involved in educating the public in Trojan horsing them, incepting truth and sound money across the world, there's no better way than using one collectible, valuable Bitcoin trading card at a time. This is a company that I am directly involved with documenting the concepts, people, the timestamps of history. The value of these cards is incredible. But the most important part is the education they provide, talking about those timestamps in history and educating people on the backs of the cards of what is actually going on, doing the job that are government-run compulsory schooling will not do. If you put in playable characters at checkout, you will receive 10% off at checkout. Playable characters, the name of the show, you will receive 10% off. I cannot wait for you to be a part of this tribe and get your hands on some of these cards and start orange filling and Trojan horse people around the world. Yeah, barring barring any uh, financial, structural, uh, large-scale incident, some sort of credit event, barring a credit event, uh, I believe that we're we're going to we, you can see that inflation has kind of settled in around the three percent range. 
I've said this for a long time. I've been saying this for over a year that there, we will have high perpetual inflation. That's what it's going to be. That inflation is due to fiscal stimulus. That's what's going on. The deficits are, are, are creating inflation. And so uh, as that continues and we have that 3% inflation, well, interest rates are going to stay higher. Now, that's the inflation that we're admitting to. I mean, the real inflation is closer to probably to 7%, but or maybe even higher. And so we're still running rates that are um, that are stimulative. I mean, you'd have to have real rates negative to um, you. What, what you want is real rates to be negative in order to continue this charade, which means that you're going to allow inflation to, to continue on. So I don't see rates going to the, the Volcker era of the 80s. I don't see them going to 16, 18, 20 percent, uh, but I can see rates structurally remaining higher here for a, a period of time as inflation continues to, to run a little bit hot. Um, does that mean that the, the Fed won't lower rates? No, I don't think so. I think there's tremendous pressure from the White House in particular, the, the, because and it doesn't matter, again, which, which um, parties right, in they control. All they all do it. They want stimulation before, they want the economy to be roaring before an election. Even if it's even if they it, they want to err on the side of inflation as long as it's not out of control, rather than the side of of uh, deflation or recession. So they're going to allow it to continue here, which means that um, we're not. I don't see the Fed raising rates. I can see them lowering them a little bit, but then inflation just becomes entrenched here which I believe it's entrenched at 3%, 3 to 4%, somewhere in there. Maybe it becomes entrenched at 6 7 8%. Uh, Luke, I think, believes it could get in the teens. It's going to have to, though. Inflation is going to have to get up into the teens in order to keep this the debt from spiraling out of control. And that means allowing inflation to run hot without raising rates to the point where you're you're burdening the treasury with too much interest cost. And then so that's kind of the push and pull there. Man, I, I could go down these rabbit holes all day. This is just <laughs> it's wild. What, do you think that really quick, if I, I want to talk about the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund and the informationist here as we kind of gather toward towards the, the end here, but do you think that? Or you talk about hockey? hockey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got to talk about hockey for a minute. Um, it, you know, 1971. I mean, there's no. You know, at that time, the U.S. military is pretty big. I mean, it's you know, we were in war, but like it was just there's a lot going on. We have a pretty big military. There's a lot of might here at that point. So yeah, I mean, you rug pull the world of their gold. You know, what are you going to do? Come get us, I guess. Right. So there wasn't a world war somehow. Um, but I mean again, how, like, how does it end at the end of the day? Like a debt jubilee. And it's just like, yeah, kumbaya. Like, sorry, we rug pulled you guys again. You know, like, how does this, how does it work at the end of the day? I mean, this, these are the things that keep me up at night where I'm like, what, how does this, how does this end? You know, like, where are we going? Should I be preparing for a war? Like, what, what are we doing here? Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good point. We had, we did have an injury war when I was a kid. Uh, we, we did have uh, the oil, the oil crisis and that was, and yeah. that was painful. Uh, and so inflation was hot and it was painful. See, I mean, we sat in line in, in my car for, for gas every other oh, wow. week. Um, and so uh, just for me to get to hockey. Um, so um, <laughs> how do we, how does it end? I, I, this could take a very long time. Yeah. Or it could happen in a flash. Uh, I believe it takes a long time. I believe that we're on this path of just continuing to grind down other currencies and have them basically fold into ours, mm -hmm. fold into the US dollar while while we just keep running the, these huge deficits and allow our our interest rate is, uh, is our the US treasury rate is higher the 10 years higher than uh, rates around the world way higher than the than the yeah. uh, the Japanese yeah, the JGBs yeah. Uh, yeah. higher than Italy Germany you know, um, the UK, it's higher across the board. And so that it, it just, it just continues to drive money to the dollar and to the treasury. 
and so this could continue for a while. And uh, I I think uh, what happens though is that they they eventually kind of lose control, and uh, inflation get, gets out of control, and people lose confidence in the long term treasuries because it they're seeing how much pers- purchasing power they're losing every single day. And so why do they want to hold something that's, that's a, 10 years or longer? And as you, as that happens, then rates are going to structurally move higher. Um, and, and that's where you see it get out of control. But I think that's a, that you're going to see hints of it and an inkling of it. Uh, you could see the treasury say, oh, we got to, you know, we're going to have to issue $2 trillion this quarter. We, we expected half a trillion and the bond market freak out. And you could see something close to a bond market failure where it goes no bid. But the, that's where the Treasury and the Fed step in, print more, and we, we start the charade again. And so uh, and th- that's just another step toward the inevitability of the, the U.S. dollar going away. And um, but you can't we can't continue on this path forever. It's a, we, they all know it. They've all admitted to it. The yeah. Treasury puts out a report every single year, and they've they labeled the report last year an, an unsustainable fiscal path. They literally labeled it for the whole world That's to right. see, which is it's a red flag to to not to the world. They're trying to warn Congress. They're like, you guys got to stop spending. We can't keep pumping debt like this. Um, and then you've got uh, Powell said it on sixty Minutes a, a few weeks ago. Yellen has said it. This is unsustainable. It's unsustainable. It's unsustainable. That's the word they use. This is unsustainable. We all know it. So what do they do? Are they going to cut spending? No, nobody's going to cut spending. Biden just said he's going to, he, he wants to spend $7.3 trillion starting this fiscal year. What? So that's okay. So it's political suicide. Nobody will do it. Everybody wants to spend money for their constituents. So you can do that. You can raise taxes, which he's talking about raising taxes on billionaires. And the amount that he's talking about raising is is just a drop on the bucket. It's not. It's going to take. I think it takes care of three days of the of spending each year. Is what he's talking about. It's ridiculous. So that that's not going to raising taxes. Ultimately, if you raise taxes on companies and people, it just doesn't work. It it it, it disincentivizes productivity. It disincentivizes uh, reinvesting back into your into your company and products, and so your your productivity ends up contracting eventually. And so your ta- you have a higher tax rate on lower productivity. You get to the same spot. And so, or you could just keep issuing bonds, which we do. We just keep borrowing. But if you do that, you have to allow for high structural inflation which we're also doing. And that's the path we're on. And we're just going to continue doing it until it just spirals out of control. It'd be like, a, you know, whoops, helicopter blade <laughs> came off and that's it. <laughs> um, really, we could go down again and go down these forever. Really quick, I want to get just your quick thoughts um, on like an update, I guess, just on the the treasury auctions. Like where where did, where did are we standing? You kind of touch on that for a second. I know we've had some, some wild rides here the last like what, six yeah. months or so. Um, where are we? Where do we kind of stand in that world right now? Well, the Treasury has been really nimble at um, managing expectations on the street and how much debt they're going to be uh, asking for, how much borrowing they're going to need. And so uh, back in late last year, uh, in November, we had a 30 year auction that was absolutely dismal. It was eye opening. It was it was it was ugly. Um Flat and so the treasury managed that, managed through that, changed expectations, managed expectations. If we're gonna we're gonna manage the the amount of debt that we have to issue here, it it uh, shored up the market. Auctions continued on, kind of unabated. We had some soft auctions, some tailing auctions, which means that uh, they trade beforehand in a when issued market. It's like um, pre pre auction, and mm-hmm. if that if those prices. Uh, are higher, meaning they the interest rate is lower than when the actual auction happens. It's not a good thing because expectations were better than act, you know reality. We've seen a bunch of tailing auctions. We had a twenty year auction uh, about a month ago that was just awful. It was it was abysmal. 
uh, looked looked very much like the like the thirty year auction. It didn't. It wasn't in in any any. I want to make it clear. It wasn't in any uh, danger of failing, but mm-hmm. it was an it was a red flag uh, to the treasury on on just how much demand there is for that duration, which is which was that was not encouraging. Mm-hmm. So then we just had a thirty year treasury treasury auction today. It wasn't that big, but um, again, it was fine. It, it went off without a hitch. It actually looked fine. Uh, it actually stopped through, meaning that the 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 bids on the actual auction were better than than the pre auction. The, the the prices paid. Wow. So, um, so we're gonna see. We're gonna see here, Brandon. We, as, as we continue to spend money, as we continue to uh, to run these deficits, we're gonna have to continue to borrow more and more. It's unclear exactly where the tax receipts are gonna come in in the next month. We'll see what that what, where that comes in and and just how much the treasury has to issue over the second quarter. Uh, but I'm going to be watching these auctions carefully uh, because the if you have if you get into a period here where you've drawn down the reverse repo market, so you can't just keep issuing T bills anymore. You've got to move further out on the on the uh, yield curve on the on the duration and start issuing more ten year, more twenty year, more thirty year treasuries. Well, um, if that that could present a problem, it could it could crimp on liquidity, especially as banks will as their as their reserves wind down. They're at they're over three trillion now. If they're you know if they're down under two and a half trillion, the the Fed starts getting nervous. The Treasury starts getting nervous on these auctions. So we're we're gonna we're gonna be watching that for sure. Do you do you foresee and, and part of this too? I guess is social media. There's been a lot of talk about this lately as well. I mean, the the, the government, you know, the ruling class they they are very aware of. Hey, whoa, these things are spreading. The bank crisis spread because of you people on social media, and you know yeah. they 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 don't like Bitcoin and they don't like social media because they don't like how fast word can spread or being outed or being called out or whatever it is. It feels like it's going to be something to that effect, like a black swan, I guess you could call it in a way, but like if there's some auctions that go no bid or there's successive things that are happening and then all of a sudden you have Bitcoiners, you have people that are in the know or paying attention and they're like shouting from the rooftops, like, hey guys, this is not good. And then you see this spark, just like we saw a year ago with the banks or it was a New York community bank. Now, I mean, things like that happening where it's like, whoa, 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 and just lights a fire. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely possible. Like. <laughs> For instance, we, you would never have had so many people que- keyed in on on treasury auctions as you do now. If I post something <laughs> yeah. on treasury auctions, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of people watching that. Um, you know, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands wow. are, are 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 seeing those posts, and that's just and so uh, that's not normal. That's that's not. But uh, it is. It's a new new. It's a new normal. Mm-hmm. When yeah. when I started on Wall Street. If you didn't have a Bloomberg terminal, you didn't know what happened in the Treasury auction. Yeah. Now you can just pull up on Twitter and uh, and you'll or X and you'll see what happened in just minutes. So pull up Zero Hedge or you know some often mine and you'll see what happened. So um, yeah, so it is it is a different world we're living in for sure. And uh, but that can also create opportunities because it creates outsized unreasonable movements and volatility and so because of the herd mentality and just the mm-hmm. sheer number of people coming into that into that trade or in the into that uh, event at that very moment it, it it often produces uh some uh i would say uh it it's not it's an inefficiency mm, yeah what what is the uh, in transitioning here a little bit? Um, Bitcoin Opportunity Fund and your newsletter, the Informationist, would love you to touch on these for a couple minutes, maybe you know for a minute or two, just seeing what you're, you know, you, you guys getting to see, you know, companies and things that are going on, some new technologies, whatever it might be in the Bitcoin space. So to talk to us for a, a minute about you know each of these yeah. and kind of what you're working on here uh, in those two spaces. Yeah, so the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund is uh, it, we launched it this the this last year. Uh, we started investing over the fall, and uh, and it's a public private partnership uh, for accredited investors. And uh, we're closed. We we we've already taken in all our investors for this for this fund, but um, we're super excited um, about how it, the capital raise went, and we've been investing along the way. 
uh, especially because we, we were in a period of extreme pain with FTX and, uh, you know, uh, Celsius and all that. But uh, what we do is we invest in and we're, we, we see ourselves as, as deep value investors in the Bitcoin opportunity space. And we're looking for uh, any opportunity. What's what's unique about us is because we're a public private hedge fund, we can invest anywhere in the space. If it's public, private, uh, early stage, late stage, we can invest in stocks on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, miners in the New York, New York Stock Exchange. We can invest in private miners. Uh, we can invest in debt. Uh, we can we can use uh, hedging strategies that that perhaps the venture funds can't do. So it's mm -hmm. a little bit different uh, in that way, in that we take the capital, we invest it, we start investing it right away. And then as we see opportunities in the private space, we're due diligence, diligence in those and then making allocations to those. But we've had some super exciting investments. You know, we're invested in a, a company in West Texas, Cormant, that is using stranded uh energy that is is just stranded out in west texas and they're mining bitcoin uh at a very wow. attractive price and and uh selling back the grid when uh when they want to or or when it's opportunistic um you know and uh that's it we love investments like that because we can structure them in a way that we remain exposed to bitcoin all the way along um and uh we've just um partnered with uh anchor watch um you know uh and uh that that is uh that's um becca rubenfels um and uh rob's doing that one and they're they're doing insurance for holders of bitcoin and using lloyds of london to back them and Super exciting because this is cool. this is really important for especially something like a family office that does want to hold their own keys, but wants to make sure that they have a backstop there. Mm, um, yeah. Especially if you're an investment advisor in a family office and you're not part of the family, you, yeah. that's something you might look for. So we're super excited about that. Um, and uh, you know we've we've got uh, some some other private investments that we've done and we're that we're due diligencing diligencing now uh, um, and we're and then of course in the public space we've we've done quite a quite a few things including volatility trading uh, volatility hedging on some of our uh, positions and investing in the miners I won't I won't name names because they're public companies yeah. but. Um, yeah, we it's been uh, it's been an exciting space. That was longer than a minute. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and, and Bob Burnett is another uh, guy that we've partnered with uh, in in the yes. in the private side, sure. uh, doing some as as a lot of people know here. Uh, we we've got a West Bay mining venture with him, and we're using uh, stranded uh, energy out in in the Dakotas, and so that that's been exciting. Uh, the Informationist is a newsletter I started um, a little over a year ago, and it's been great. I've all I, I, I started it truly, Brandon, just to give people insight into what's going on in the world, of, in my world of institutional mm -hmm. investing and how all these things work, but in a, in a super simplistic way. So I try to simplify everything that anybody can understand. We've got... I've got um, anybody from nurses, firefighters, EMTs, lawyers. Uh, um, I've got chemical engineers. I've got professional dancers. I've got photographers. You know, it's a wide range of of uh, of interests and backgrounds there. And the common theme is that they're all interested in investing and interested in knowing all these things, but they were never taught them. I mean, none of us were. And they don't want to hear, they don't want to go read a textbook about it, um, but they want to know what these acronyms mean. When yeah. the Fed does this, you know, the BTFP, like, what is that? And how does it work? Tell me in simple terms. And it's not like, tell me like I'm five, but it's like, tell me like I'm a super, super uh, interested and, and uh, curious person, but I have none of the financial terminology. Tell me that way. And so it's been great. It's grown over, it's um, over 30,000 subscribers now. Um, it's Congrats. free. You can, and you can find it on jameslavish.com. And yeah, we'll link to it. Amazing. Out every Sunday. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I've gotten great okay. feedback. We have an awesome community there. So uh, is it just, yeah. is it just you writing it and doing everything for it? That's, it's, yeah, I'm a one man show. That's amazing. <laughs> it is. It's phenomenal. 
it, it is one of the best, better, best, better ones. I'll say better just to be conservative, I guess, but it's one of the better ones out there. It really is. It's, it's, uh, it's really good. Well, we'll link I to it and stuff. So, really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So we, we got to play a word, quick word association game here in a minute, but really quickly, okay the the brief story of you know hockey again that's for anyone that knows you know, we, we both played college hockey uh i played michigan state james played at yale and um and not against each other <laughs> not against each other. Yeah, they were a couple of years apart um but uh you know have a background in that space and it, it's cool to see more people coming in from uh you know, athletics and the different world into Bitcoin. So um, give me, give me the brief, you know, kind of overview for the people, just, you know, what that was like and just kind of the lessons you kind of learned from that just to where you are now. Yeah. I mean, look, when I was uh, in, in high school, uh, I, I was playing a number of sports of playing soccer, baseball, uh, hockey. And as you, as we did when we were kids, you guys yeah. didn't, but when I was a kid, you played everything. And I didn't really commit to hockey until I was about a junior. Uh, and, wow. but, uh, senior year, I grew a lot. Uh, I did, I did, I, I had some really good games and, uh, and I got noticed by the, by the Boston Bruins scouts. And so at one of the summer games out in Boston, we played in, in leagues out there. You, you may remember hockey night in Boston, that stuff. And I got, I got noticed mm -hmm. out there in, in a different league, but, um, and so, uh, they drafted me when I was 18. And as you know, and for your listeners, when you're when you, in hockey, you get drafted at 18 and then you go off to university and the team that drafted you basically owns your rights for four years and then they have to decide what to do. And so I went and I played at Yale and uh, was doing great. Everything was awesome. Uh, my line, I was I was fortunate to be on a line with uh, the all time leading scorer for Yale all time history. Uh, Mark Kaufman, he was a phenomenal player. Um, and basically I, I was super fortunate to be on the line with him and some of the best players in, in the whole league. Uh, we had a number of all Americans on that line. Um, and so, uh, everything's going great. It's awesome. I'm on, I'm on the U S national team, trying out for the Olympics, uh, and, uh, and senior year, I, I take one hit. This is a regular game playing against St. Lawrence and was taking a puck out of the zone. I got hit the wrong way. My knee popped and, uh, and I, I tore my ligaments and I basically just didn't recover from that. Uh, it was wow. terrible timing. And I, 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 I was like, we, I was on my way. I, I was 100% sure I was going to be signed by the Bruins. Um, I couldn't have an agent yet, but I was, I was talking to agents yeah. and they, they, we, they were kind of edging in to figure out giving you the scoop. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I wasn't look, I wasn't the best one on the team, but, um, but I was one of the guys that was, that had high potential to go. Mm -hmm. And so as a senior and, uh, and it was just like that, it was over in a flash. Um, and I, I made the tough decision to be truthful. I made the tough decision. I wasn't going to kind of going to be the guy who's just going to splash into the NHL and be a starter. I, I would have had to ground, grind it out in the AHL or whatever for a little bit, yep. even if, even if I was perfectly healthy, but I went to New York Rangers camp um, and Mark Messier was there. These are long stories. So I can, we will have to have another podcast about yeah. this, but, cool. um, and I, you know, I tried, I, 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 I tried, but I wasn't there. I wasn't, I wasn't healthy enough. And I was like, this is going to take me years to, to get back to where I was. And I just graduated Yale and I was like, I need money. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I just, I knew in my heart that it was going to take, it was going to take too long to get there. And I wasn't sure if I would ever get back to hundred percent. I mean, my knee was shattered. Um, Jeez. and so, and back then, uh, you, we didn't have the kind of surgeries you do now where you're, you're, you, yeah. you, you have an ACL blowout, you're back on, on the field or back yeah. on the ice in less than a year. I mean, we, I would have been back on the ice in a year, but it would have been a long anyway. Yeah. So I decided, made the tough decision that it, I was going to have to pivot and talk to some of my friends, hockey players who were on wall street. And they said, you got to see mm -hmm. what we do. And, uh, they introduced wow. me to a bunch of people and I got hired to be a clerk on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, you know, getting coffee and wow. tuna fish sandwiches for the brokers. <laughs> That's amazing. But 
I, my, my first job was, uh, I mean, honestly, it was uh, because I was pretty good at math. It was, it was trading ADR arbitrage on the floor of the stock exchange. So, which is basically just trading the arbitrage between foreign shares and, and domestic shares that trade on between London or Europe or um, Asia or Mexico on the floor. So yeah, it was wow. pretty wild. Well, next time so that's how I are... landed. I got drafted by the boss and I landed on wall street. <laughs> yeah. I, there you go. I next time. Yeah. Like you said, we'll um, maybe in person or, or whatever has made a few months when we do it on here. If next conference we'll have to do, we're gonna do a hockey a stories pod for sit down for 30 minutes and just, we'll share stories and record it because that's, you know, I, that's how, you know, even in the beginning a year and a half ago was we had some very similar stories played for the U S national team, got really hurt when I was 18 years old. And, you know, I played for a few more, played for a handful of years still, but did had to make that tough decision of like, yeah, this you know is just, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Once, so, once you get injured like that in hockey, it's, I mean, it's a, uh, we've seen it in the pros. You see some of the guys, you just never, yes. they're just never the same because it's such a physical game. Um, yes. I mean, you see it in football often oh, yeah. you just, yep. if, if you get hurt in football, often you're just knocked out. So, yep. um, but you don't see people like Tony Romo re recovering from a back injury. And I think that's just, it's tough. Right. It's, these games are very few. Yeah. They're physical. They're really physical, but um, it was awesome. I loved it. I'm thankful for it. It definitely set me on the right path. Uh, it did. And going to your initial question, which is really important. I do believe it kept me on the rails. And as far as mm -hmm. uh, just learning that, that grit, that determination, that sheared, a determination and uh, and tenacity to go after what I wanted uh, and have the discipline to do it in a way that that got me there. Um, and hockey players are they're they're typically uh, pretty humble and low key. Uh, yeah. They don't you know they don't dance around. You'll get your head chopped off if you do. Um, <laughs> so uh, True. you know um, and uh, so it keeps you it keeps you grounded. And, uh, and it has, uh, I'm way, I'm definitely way more grounded today than I was when I was a 21 year old high flying kid. Uh, but, um, I got grounded pretty quickly after that injury. I'll tell you that much. So, um, yeah, life yeah. is, life is, life is strange, but you, you, like you just pivot and you do it. You just keep going. That's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great lesson. It's a, such a great <laughs> lesson. All right. Last segment. Last segment presented by, gonna grab them, Bitcoin trading cards. So oh, our, our podcast oh, yeah. here presented by Bitcoin trading cards, Orange Pilling the World, a new segment presented by Bitcoin trading cards, Sweet. word association. So we're gonna do a word association this time. Got a, a list of, of words, just rattle them off, whatever's in your head, and then okay. we'll we'll end this bad boy. The Bitcoin ETFs. Oh, money. <laughs> Hyper Bitcoinization. Soon. Michael Saylor. Oh, genius. Sam Bankman Fried. <laughs> Fraud. <laughs> Politics. Lies. <laughs> Wizards. <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, banks. Uh, <laughs> Cantillon. <laughs> Ooh. Women in Bitcoin needed. Mm, like that. Bitcoin conferences. Uh, it's stimulating. Community. Oh, strength. Janet Yellen. <laughs> Retire. <laughs> Jerome Powell. <laughs> Should be retired. Oh, sorry. One word. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, what? honestly, honestly, the word that really does come into mind for Powell is pickle. Oh, you know, I, I thought you might actually go that route. I love that. I didn't think of that word, though. I love that. I, th I thought you were going to say like stuck or something. I love that. Yeah. Um, debt spiral. <laughs> In it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben Bernanke. Uh, uh, I would say, uh, oh, over uh what's the word i'm looking for there's a word i'm looking for um over revered oh like that bitcoin trading cards uh 
I, uh, <laughs> classic is the word that comes in my mind, but that's it. <laughs> Love that. Um, Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. Opportunity. <laughs> the Informationist. Simple. Love that. James, thank you so much. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you for coming on today. It was an absolute yeah, blast. Of course, it was fun. Yeah. Be good. Yeah. I, I've got some good feedback over this past week. I just started doing this week. Spesky was like dying too. He was like, this is hilarious. Um, so I appreciate, <laughs> appreciate appreciate you coming on and um, look forward to doing it again soon, seeing you soon and uh, appreciate you being a playable character because boy, do we need more of them. Thanks brother. Yeah, of course. It's a pleasure to be here, Brandon. I look forward to talking about hockey sometime soon. Absolutely. And where, where can people find you lastly? Uh, obviously on Twitter, I'm just James Lavish. Um, my, uh, the information is at just jameslavish.com. It's there's a link in my Twitter bio. And, uh, and for, if you're interested in being on the list for future Bitcoin opportunity, uh, funds or investments, then you can email us there at Bitcoin opportunity fund. Just go on, um, it's www.bitcoinopportunity.fund and sign up and attest that you're accredited an investor and we can send you information. So beautiful. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Awesome. See you next time. If you like this interview with James Lavish, you're going to love the one I just did with Jeff Booth, where we talk about AI and Bitcoin. Come on, check it out. Or you might love the one we just did recently with Larry Lapard talking about the Bitcoin ETFs. Come on, check it out.